A leisurely stroll through the lush rainforests of southeast Queensland ought to leave even the most inattentive of visitors with little doubt of the sheer natural beauty of the region. Every step you take, the forest seems more and more to be actively forcing itself upon your senses, as your eyes behold the grandeur of age-old trees who stand, twisted and scarred, in defiance to centuries worth of hardship, of storms, fires and floods. All the while, your ears behold a chorus of birds singing from perches unseen, and your lungs are filled with air so fresh that each and every breath is a moment worth savouring. Yet even a forest so primed to seize the undivided attention of our every sense has its secrets, miniature marvels overlooked by many, and it was these that I had come to discover. From the undergrowth to the canopy, the rainforest is a sea of green, but if you look a little closer, you may be able to spot a few other colours peppered amidst the verdant visage. With its fiery orange body and bold black spots, Kantao Pardentum stands out garishly in this dimly lit world. One of the first rules of nature is that being conspicuous is often a warning sign, and while this enchanting little insect poses no risk to us humans, it is not by any means defenceless. When threatened, it can release pungent chemicals from glands on its thorax, which, with a bit of luck, may be sufficient to halt the advances of a curious predator. Cantal parentum belongs to a group of insects called the Hemipterans, characterised by their straw-like mouthparts, which this species uses to pierce the foliage of plants upon which it feeds, and suck out the sap within. For Cantal parentum and countless other animals, the trunks of trees serve as vertical highways between the gloomy realm of the undergrowth and the verdant canopy basking in sunlight up above. But they do not necessarily afford safe passage for the wary traveller. The trunks of many trees are imperfect, bearing deep gashes and hollows, etched upon them in their older days and carved ever deeper by decay. And in these nooks and crannies, a particularly enigmatic hunter sometimes settles. Spun flat against the mossy trunk of its host, the home site of a funnel web spider. Funnel webs are for the most part ground dwelling spiders, but a select few species from the genus Hadronici opt to set up their silken snares upon the trunks of trees, including Hadronici formidabilis, the biggest of them all. The hunter's lair is well hidden. Pieces of moss, lichen and other debris are often incorporated into the webbing and the growth of green algae on its surface heightens the disguise further still. Though their choice of habitat may differ, the homes of these tree-dwelling funnel webs parallel those of many of their terrestrial counterparts in terms of overall structure. They nearly all possess multiple entrances, each fringed with an expansive network of trip lines that alert the spider within to the presence and whereabouts of anything wandering around outside. The spider upon being roused from its slumber, will emerge from the nearest entrance to seize its target, before dragging it back into its silken shelter to consume it in safety. Though solitary in nature, funnel webs can nevertheless be found living in close proximity. The spider's limited mobility means babies may not move very far from their mother before settling, and cases like this, wherein the webs of smaller spiders can be seen right next to a bigger one, are not at all a rare sight. Funnel webs aren't the only ambush extraordinaires in these rainforests either. On the moist forest floor, other spiders have set up even more cunningly hidden traps. This is the burrow of a trapdoor spider, likely a member of the genus Shuoplos, and like the funnel webs, trapdoors can have a bit of a green thumb when it comes to sprucing up their homes often allowing mosses and liverworts to proliferate on the burrow's lid. This, doubtless, makes for excellent camouflage, but paradoxically, it was the main thing that allowed me to spot this burrow. A somewhat out of place, neatly circular patch of moss was a dead giveaway. The forest floor is littered with logs of all shapes and sizes, 
some freshly fallen and others worn down beyond recognition by years of decay. And in death, the rainforest trees are as much a source of food and shelter as they are in life. Beneath almost every single rotting log is a proliferation of millipedes. These multi-legged marbles are some of the oldest land living animals, among the first creatures to breathe the air of an ancient, hostile planet. Their legs, moving in an almost hypnotic, wave-like motion, bore them over dry land at a time when our own ancestors were still swimming in the seas. And yet still these pioneers thrive, in a world that has, in so many ways, moved on from the one their forebears first conquered. Today, polydesmids like this are among the most speciose of the major millipede groups, and this large marone species was especially common in this location. Like most millipedes, it reacts to danger by coiling up in a tight spiral, shielding its vulnerable underside and making it difficult for a predator to find a way in. Many polydesmids, like this Philocladosoma, identifiable by its stunning black and white chevron patterning, possess prominent keels on the sides of each segment that protrude outwards when the animal coils, possibly augmenting the defence. Other millipedes, like Procyliosoma, have taken this common method of self-protection to another level. Their shorter bodies curl not into a spiral, but a sphere, and they close upon themselves so seamlessly that, for a predator, there appears to be no way to bypass the tough dorsal exoskeleton at all. I pretty much always find them in this defensive pose, but should you have a little patience, they may just decide to open up and begin to explore. Due to their slow speed and generally laid-back approach to life, millipedes tend to be very cooperative when it comes to filming, which unfortunately is not what I can say about their distant cousins. Yep, this is all my centipede footage for the day. But it's not like I have any shortage of centipedes to film at home, so no issues there. Contrary to their predatory and not so photogenic relatives, millipedes feed predominantly on the rotting logs they inhabit, and are a vital part of the nutrient cycle breaking down old plant matter so that nutrients that were hitherto locked within the remains of dead plants become free once more to fuel the growth of the living. It is the ceaseless endeavours of detritivores like millipedes that keeps the rainforest floor clear of the accumulation of centuries worth of fallen debris. These spineless animals are, ironically, the backbone of the ecosystem. And nor are they the only decomposers that prosper in these cool, moist forests, bursting forth from almost every log and tree stump, and arising from the ground itself are the fruiting bodies of fungi, the only visible portions of a vast network of filaments coursing beneath the surface. These are Hericium coralloides, a truly stunning sight when fresh, though these particular specimens have definitely seen better days. A little less conspicuous are these Lycopodon, possibly of the species Lycopodon perlatum, quite a common fungus with an almost worldwide distribution. Lycopodon belongs to a group of fungi called the puffballs, so named because of the way they spread their spores. Younger specimens, like these, have a firm interior, but as the fungus matures and the spores within are ready to be dispersed, the inside of the puffball changes from firm and white to brown and powdery, and a small opening called an osteole forms at the apex. And when the mature puffball is subjected to even the slightest of external pressures, a cloud of spores is ejected through the osteole. The fruiting bodies of fungi are an appetising food source for many of the smaller inhabitants of the rainforest. Some of the most insatiable are the multitude of large, native snails that can be found in the region, like this Thersites richmondiana, easily recognisable on the basis of its remarkable keeled shell. For much of the duration of this little adventure, the track upon which I walked was paralleled by a narrow stream of pure, fresh water, 
coursing through a labyrinth of boulders, fallen trees, and tangled roots. But its journey was not one of ceaseless movement, for a multitude of small pools sat upon its course, and in each the water would gather, settling from its turbulence to form a crystal clear mirror so smooth and still that it captured the likeness of the canopy above with not wave nor ripple to distort it. And it is here that a remarkable little insect chooses to hunt. These are Macrogyrus, commonly known as whirligig beetles, and it's not by accident that they're all in the water, for Macrogyrus are highly specialised for an aquatic lifestyle with flat, paddle-shaped legs, and eyes split in a manner that allows them to see both above and below water simultaneously. They prey on any insects unfortunate enough to fall on their watery hunting field, and few creatures trapped on the pool's surface can match the beetle's swimming prowess well enough to stand any chance of escaping. And with that, we come to the end of yet another adventure around Southeast Queensland's local wonders. Trudging through the forest by day is interesting enough, but if you really want to see it come alive, it's worth paying a visit at night. And if you want to see what I mean by that, then check out this video to see what even a completely unremarkable bush reserve yields under the cover of darkness. And of course, if you enjoyed this video, then feel free to subscribe. Thank you for watching, and I shall see you all again next time.